celebration. Teach us to pray. This morning we're continuing uh, in our series, Teach Us to Pray, as we walk through the most famous sermon, this model, this template for prayer that Jesus gave us. Uh, Some of you may remember this story. October 2nd, 2006, pretty horrendous event. A man by the name of Charles Roberts walks into a one-room Amish schoolhouse in Pennsylvania uh, and does the unthinkable. And I'm not even gonna go into the detail of what happened that day because I don't wanna think about it and I don't wanna walk through it. I, I, I know from the story that there was some kids and teachers that he allowed to leave but some that had to stay. By the time it was all said and done, there were 10 young girls that were shot, five of them were killed. You can imagine something like this immediately made national if not global news. It was this incredible act of evil, something unthinkable. Uh, Charles Roberts ended up taking his own life in that schoolroom that day. You can imagine the publicity it got. But it's actually what happened next that caught the attention of the world. Because what happened next was really unthinkable. That this Amish community that had just experienced this tragedy of epic proportions and the dads of those girls who were killed began actively pursuing reconciliation with the family of the murderer. I'm talking about moments after this happened, a group from the Amish community would go to this family's house of this man who had just killed several of their children and they would sit with them and mourn with them. They would tell them, you know what, we forgive you for what's happened because we're not gonna allow this bitterness and unforgiveness to ruin us, to ruin our hearts, and to sit in on our community. The things that would happen and the stories that I've read from this, honestly, as I read them, I'm thinking to myself, would that even be possible for me? I mean, one of the elder leaders of this Amish community literally sat with the father of the murderer and they held each other for an hour as they just mourned together. This Amish community would set up a, a fund to help the kids and the wife and the widow of the murderer later on. I mean, we could go on and on, things that happened. As the world cried, for, cried out hatred or at least for justice, the Amish offered forgiveness and love at a level that most people couldn't comprehend. Marie Roberts, the wife of the killer, would write, your compassion has reached beyond our family, beyond our community, and now it's changing our world. See, doing something nice, an act of compassion, an act of mercy, I mean, that's, that's something that changes the world. But I truly believe this, there is nothing more transformative than loving your enemy or offering forgiveness when it's undeserved. There's nothing more Jesus than doing that because how many know nothing is more counterintuitive? In our flesh, we wanna respond, we wanna react, and when you choose to love someone that doesn't deserve it, I think that's only the spirit of God at work within us. What's crazy about this story is that the world, there's a lot of people in the world and the culture was outraged when they heard about the Amish community acting in love and forgiveness because there's some people in our mind that just don't deserve it, right? Like, you've crossed a line. I don't know if, if they deserve it. See, we're at this point in the Lord's Prayer where he leads us to pray and forgive us our sins, our trespasses, our debts, as we forgive those who have sinned or trespassed against us. As we've practiced every week in this series, we're gonna put uh, the Lord's Prayer on the screen. Uh, can we say it together? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. I love what Preston Sprinkle says in his book, Scandalous Grace. He says, if you've lost the scandal and the offense of the cross, right, as it dangles around your neck, what he talks about is you get so accustomed to the cross, you forget the scandal, right? You forget the offense of the cross. He says, if you aren't challenged by the scandal of God dying for his enemies, if you aren't stunned by Jesus pardoning the prostitutes or forgiving the murderer, if you aren't outraged by an unrobed king of kings and lord of lords turning the other cheek, 
resisting retaliation or offering up his life for those taking his life. Maybe you need to revisit the cross. Maybe you've come to this table so many times that you just kind of go through the motions and I take the bread and I take of the wine, but I forget what it means. I forget how offensive it was for religious leaders and people when Jesus said, oh, actually, you, I don't know if you're in the kingdom of God because you think you are, but you're walking in your own pride, but you who are outside, you think you're outside, you're actually inside. I mean, how offensive that really would have been to someone who lived their whole life in sin, and yet Jesus was on the cross saying, guess what, today you're gonna be with me in paradise even though you live 99.9% of your life in rebellion to me. That's offensive to somebody who's religious, isn't it? You're telling me that guy? Yep, that guy. Have we forgotten the power of the cross? The scandal of the cross, the, the offense of the cross. Jesus leads us to pray, and forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses. So, so do we comprehend the gravity of our sin, our need for redemption, and God's unconditional love for us? Do we realize that? Do we come to this table not with pride, but with this humility that says, man, every day I am reliant on the grace and the love of God, every day, right? If it wasn't for the grace of God. Do we forget that in Luke 15, that prodigal son that went away and squandered everything on wild living, that's us in this story. You're like, but pastor, I haven't done that. No, but your rebellion and sin did. Or do we think that we're the older brother, right? Remember the older brother in that story? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good, and he was bitter because why would we throw a party for a prodigal when I've been here and I never left? Forgive us our trespasses. And then it says, as we forgive those who trespass against us, will we freely give the forgiveness to others that we have received in Christ? This is the question that Jesus is asking, and this is what he's leading us to pray into. There's a story that, goes, go, that really coincides with what we just read in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 18, verse 23, we're gonna read it. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now let's stop for just a minute. Because prevalent Jewish thought, most rabbis during that time said that you should forgive somebody at least three times. So Peter's thinking he's like this righteous, holier than thou disciple. Like, I'm gonna go up to seven because I'm a really good Christian, right? To which Jesus answers, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured and he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This servant owes the king, the master, a significant amount of money. The word significant is really important here. 10,000 talents, 60,000 denarii. In 100 and 1,000 lifetimes, you could never pay it back. Jesus is throwing out a number so astronomically high, it's beyond their comprehension. Today, it would be like talking about billions of dollars. You're like, it doesn't, it, when you talk about billions of dollars, you stop thinking about it, because it's just so much money, you'll never see it, right? <laughs> Like your debt would be so high, it doesn't matter what I do. I could work off as hard as I could. I'm not even gonna come close to paying it off. And the man comes in and the master says, you're forgiven. You're, re you're released from paying any of it. And that servant goes out and finds another servant who owes him some money. A hundred silver coins, about a hundred days work. 
So not, not so much that you couldn't pay it off, right? But he doesn't show mercy. He throws the man in debtor's prison. The king or the master forgives a debt 600,000 times more than what the servant refused to give the other servant. Can we just let that story settle in for a second? Like, I don't need to explain this one to you. You're really smart. You know who the master is. You know who the king is. You know who the servant is. Think about that for a second. Think about the implications. Peter to Jesus. Jesus, how many times should we forgive? Seven? To which Jesus would look at Peter. Peter, well, how, what's the link that you've been forgiven? Tell me that. So the same measure that you've been forgiven, you should reciprocate that and do that to others. It's powerful, isn't it? See, if you and I don't understand the debt that we owed, we will walk around holding everybody account to account for every little thing that they've done. Oh, pay me my 50, pay me my 100, my 150. But when you get this revelation of the grace and love of God, how do you possibly hold on to that? How do you hold on to that? See, unforgiveness is often a sign that we have failed to understand the gravity of our sin and the finished work of the cross. There's something deficient. I want you to understand what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, I'll forgive you if you forgive others. He's saying, if you don't forgive others, you need to look deep inside and ask yourself, do I understand what Jesus has done for me? Do I understand what Christ has done for me? I love what N.T. Wright says. He says, being a person of the kingdom of God and not offering forgiveness to others is like cutting off the very branch you're sitting on. I love that. Not offering forgiveness, but yet being someone who knows that I need forgiveness. Do you know there's so many people out there that they know that they're broken and need forgiveness, but we just, for whatever reason, we can't give it to others? It's like cutting off the very branch we're sitting on. See, but forgiveness in this context, the definition, it's letting go, it's releasing, it's sending away the resentment or the right to exact revenge. Like you are letting go of the outcomes, letting go of this vengeance, this retribution, the right to hate. Matthew's prayer in the Lord's Prayer is actually this. He prays, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In the first century, uh, if you couldn't repay a debt, there were two possible outcomes for you. Number one, you became a slave to that person until you repaid it. Or number two, they threw you into debtor's prison until somebody, somebody maybe paid off your debt. How many know often you never got your debt paid off and so you just stayed there until you died? How many know both options stink? No thanks. What I love about this is the act of paying off someone's debt, you know what it was called? Redemption. Come on now, isn't that good? that someone came in and paid off my debt. So that's called redemption. You know what that person was called? The redeemer. The redeemer. Powerful, isn't it? Father, I thank you for paying off my massive debt as I go around paying off all the little debts that are owed to me. That's what I choose to do. That's what I choose to do. And you and I have this choice every single day. You have a choice every day to walk in forgiveness or un unforgiveness. Every single day, you have the choice of freedom or offense. If you have an offendable heart, guess what? Offense will be everywhere around you. Everywhere, isn't it? I mean, you could be offended at every single moment, every person that comes across your path, if you wanted to. You have the option of joy or bitterness. That's why if you and I are gonna make this with a heart after God, we have to practice reconciliation every single day. We have to be people of reconciliation. We have to be willing to have hard conversations, amen? We have to say the things that need to be said. We have to actively pursue it because if not, guess what, that builds up, doesn't it? We store things up, we store things away. I'm gonna use uh, an example this morning uh, of marriage, and, and let me just say this. You, you may not be married in this room, uh, but you understand, you're gonna understand this because it doesn't, doesn't just affect marriages, it's all relationships. In marriage, what do we do? We enter into a covenant with another person. That covenant is to say, before God, I'm going to help you look more like Jesus. 
That's God's vision for marriage. I'm gonna help you move towards holiness. I'm gonna help you move towards the image of Christ. This is a picture in Ephesians 5 that God gives us. This is our vision for marriage. My job, to move you towards holiness. How many know most people never start, or start with that vision? They go into marriage trying to find themselves or contentment or fulfillment or this American dream. No, I'm gonna help you move towards Jesus. And here's the thing about marriage. No one will ever know more about you than that person, right? They know your deepest insecurity. They know your failures. They know all your little intricacies, the things that get on their nerves, right? All your successes and all your failures, all your little quirks, and you've got them, right? They know everything. And in marriage, this picture is literally, we are laid bare before one another, emotionally, spiritually, physically. And my job is to help you move more like Jesus. That's the, that's the job God has given me for my wife, Lindsay, is to steward her life. Everything in her is to help move her towards Christ-likeness. But how many know when you get that close to somebody, you can use those insecurities for good or for bad, can't you? That's what's so hard about the intimacy of relationships and death in relationships is because when you put yourself out there, now that can be used for good and bad, can't it? And how do we choose to use it? How do we use our spouse's struggles or insecurities or past? Do we help them move towards Jesus or not? Here's what I've learned what happens in marriage often, is maybe we were never taught this, maybe we never, we never had good images of marriage, but we, we get in conflict, because how many know conflict is inevitable, right? It's not if you fight, it's how you fight. Come on now, you can nod your head, it's okay. You fight, I fight. We know conflict is inevitable with our spouse. And in the midst of some kind of conflict in order to win or to get the upper hand, what do we do? We say something. We use their insecurity against them. We know where that deepest wound lies and we put our finger in it to try to get the upper hand. And how many know you can come back and you can heal from wounds but you can't take words back, can you? And that's driven deep into the heart of our spouse. And then because maybe we haven't uh, had other good uh, examples in our life, what do we do? We, we take uh, instances from the past, and we'll use the past. Well, you know what you did, what you always do, because that's what you've always done. Like, this is the person we've covenanted in to protect and steward, and how many know words hurt? And I've learned over the years doing marriage counseling that a lot of people never talked about boundaries and conflict, and so a lot of couples, when they get in conflict, it's like the gloves come off, right? When Lindsay and I before we sit down for marriage, we made a list of things that we agree not to do in marriage. We don't sleep in separate bedrooms. We don't leave the house until, unless we tell that person where we're going and when we'll be back, right? We don't name call. We don't bring up the past. We don't yell. And, and, and couples practice these things. And what happens is nobody ever says, I'm sorry. Nobody ever seeks reconciliation. If you're gonna have a healthy marriage or any kind of relationship, the first two words you need to learn is I'm sorry. Come on now, somebody shout me down this morning. You better learn it quick and you better say it often. And we get stuck in this pattern where we normalize hurtful behavior. We normalize saying things and we don't seek reconciliation. We don't seek forgiveness and so we just kind of add to it, don't we? And another word is spoken. And I leave the house because I'm mad and I'm not, I, may, I may come back or may not. What you've just done is plant a seed in your spouse's heart and mind that says, you know what, this may or may not work out. I, I think what we do a lot of times in marriage is we just practice divorce. Right? We say that word. We hit on those insecurities. No reconciliation. No word spoken. What happens after a while? We just stack one thing on top of the other. And then we get to a place in our marriage or relationships where we're like, I just don't feel what I used to feel for you. I've fallen out of love. All these things that we can say, right? Well, what happened? When you have bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, you are gonna be incapable of ever having a depth of relationship and intimacy with another person, right? 
And we don't even realize it because it accumulates over time. This is not in a day. This is weeks, months, and years. And the couple will come to me or a counselor or things like that. And it's like, this is what we're going through. And I'll have to go back and saying, hey, um, I, I can counsel you, but you need to go to a therapist or you need to do the deep work and you need to go back and you need to reconcile some things that were broken. You can't take those words back, but guess what? You can heal from those words. Do you know the secret sauce for death in relationship and marriage? You know what it is? You ready? Humility. It's humility. Humility. I'm quick to say that I'm sorry because I know I'm gonna screw up. We have boundaries for conflict. There are things that I, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna speak that over you because I'm here to steward and protect your heart. We don't leave things unreconciled. And I know you, sometimes you don't wanna have that conversation with your spouse or your friend or your family member, but guess what, you do, because you don't wanna carry the bitterness. You walk in humility. You, you know the effects of being a person in your marriage or in your relationships who's quick to reconcile and forgive? You know what the effects of that is? You know what you choose to live with? You choose to live light and free. You're not carrying around, around these huge weights and bag, bags of literally just, just crushing you. You experience depth of relationship and community. Because here's what everybody thinks when a relationship is broken down or marriage broken down. Here's, here's what everybody thinks. Well, if you would just change, this would get better. Guess what? You're in this relationship too. And it has to start in you before it's ever gonna start in them. It has to change in you first, right? Let, let me just tell you, after sitting down with hundreds of couples, if I can get a couple to see what is deficient in their own hearts and own lives, there is a chance for reconciliation and often it will happen. If they're not willing to look inside, there's no hope. There's no hope. You know what else you do in your marriage when you create a place of reconciliation? You create a safe place where it's okay to not be okay, right? It's a place of vulnerability where it's like, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, and that's okay because I'm still gonna be here and you're gonna be here and it's not if we figure this out, it's how. How many know that's freeing? Is that, is, is that security not freeing? No, I'm on your team, I'm on your side. Like We're gonna figure this out. That takes humility and forgiveness and being people of reconciliation. Let me tell you what forgiveness does not mean. It doesn't mean what the other person did is okay, right? We're not saying that. It doesn't mean you have to forget or even overlook what they've done. Some things you can't just forget. You have to work through it. You don't have to go on like nothing, nothing ever happened. People sometimes think that, that it's just like forgetting it or just like under the rug or like we're just gonna act like, no, that's not peacemaking. No, that's false peace. Forgiveness doesn't mean they shouldn't receive consequences for actions. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you never feel pain or anger or sadness about the situation. Nope, you're gonna have emotions. Sometimes you'll emotionally respond. Forgiveness doesn't mean you shouldn't you should allow the offender to continually mistreat you or your loved ones. I just have to say that out loud because there's a lot of people that are abused or mistreated and they think they just have to stay in it. No, you don't, right? But what are some of the potential warning signs of unforgiveness? What are some of these things that, that we have to evaluate continually? Is there lingering anger or resentment? And there's something that I'm carrying and I just, I can't quite get over it. You relive the offense over and over in your head. You're always playing it out again and again. Maybe it's avoidance. Maybe it's seeking revenge. You bring up the past because you're constantly living there. You lack empathy. You hold grudges towards others. It negatively impacts all your relationships. This is really hard to see in yourself, but can I just tell you unforgiveness and bitterness will impact every other relationship in your life? Because what do you do? You begin to close your heart. This hardness begins to grow over you. There's walls that you've built up with everyone, right? And when we've been hurt, what do we say to ourselves? I'm never gonna be hurt again. And so I'm gonna build the wall even higher. I'm gonna make sure that I protect myself. You carry it like a weight in your soul. Unforgiveness like becomes this wall this block. 
I want you to hear me this morning because I, I believe forgiveness is both a decision and a process. I'm not a pastor that says you could just come up here and you know, we qu- uh, pray a quick prayer, you leave your way and, and it's done. I do believe the Holy Spirit can absolutely set you free from unforgiveness, amen? I believe in therapy, I have one, right? I have a therapist. I believe in a process. I believe in sometimes you leave the room and you have to go and actively pursue reconciliation. Like it's more than just a prayer, sometimes it's saying I'm sorry. <laughs> sometimes it's making a phone call, setting up a meeting, right? We have to actively be people of reconciliation. But guess what? That's what we've called, been called to be. Jesus says if anybody should be rec- people of reconciliation, it's us, right? Because we've been reconciled through the cross and our debt was massive. So why would I hold little things over somebody when the king has literally let me off the hook of a debt that I could never repay in a thousand lifetimes? Two questions I want to ask us. Number one, will you receive forgiveness? How many know you have to receive forgiveness to give forgiveness? You have to know that your sin has separated you from God, and yet he reconciled you through the work of the cross. You have to receive it. If you haven't received it, you will not be able to give it. You have to receive it, and maybe that's your response this morning. Maybe before God can break through and tear down this wall of bitterness and unforgiveness, you need to receive the love of God yourself. You need to receive forgiveness. You need to ask for repentance, right? Here's the second question. Will you release unforgiveness? Will you release unforgiveness? See, I think maybe some of you in the room, you're aware of some of the bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness that lives within you. But I think sometimes, maybe there's you in the room, unless the Holy Spirit reveals it, you're not even aware that it exists, and you just choose to carry around this weight with you all the time. How many know when you carry a big weight and you just carry it every day, you you forget it's even there. You're You're just used to be loaded down by it. And the Holy Spirit wants to reveal that to you. If you would, this morning, stand your feet with me across this room. As we pray this prayer of Jesus, my prayer for you all week, and pre-service prayer this morning we prayed for you, is that you would just release whatever unforgiveness or bitterness may live inside of you, whatever you've been carrying, big or small. Maybe it's something that happened to you, and you relive it, and you relive it. A word that was spoken over you that was undeserved, but it lodged in your heart. I know what that's like. I mean, I can deflect a thousand arrows, but for some reason that arrow pierced my heart. That word got through my defenses and it went to my soul. And maybe that person meant to do it or maybe they didn't even, but I've been carrying it. I have to release it. What's the source and the example of our forgiveness? It's this, Luke chapter 23, verse 32. Listen to these words. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. If you're saying to yourself, I've been wronged, something's happened to me that I didn't deserve, guess what? Jesus knew exactly what you were gonna go through, and he became our example, amen? He released the very people that had put him on the cross, not holding on to that bitterness and unforgiveness, but forgiving them. Father, we thank you right now for the work of the Spirit in our lives, always leading us into life and to freedom and truth. 
God, so we pray difficult prayers. We lean into hard things. And Father, we ask this morning that you would shine the spotlight of your spirit on our soul. If there are people in this room that have been carrying weights of bitterness and unforgiveness, Father, that they would be set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, would we get such a revelation of your love today that we would be incapable of carrying unforgiveness with us. God, I pray for somebody this morning that walked into this room that first and foremost, they just have to make the conscious decision that I wanna release it, I wanna be free. God, I thank you that one of the greatest traps of the enemy is keep us locked up in this, but God, you desire freedom. You desire freedom. Would you bring that to your people this morning? Bring that to your people. God, we ask God that you would set us free. We pray these things in Jesus' name. City Church, we're gonna prepare to come to the table like we do every week. The source of our unforgiveness is found in the work of Jesus, amen? And we're gonna come to the table and we're gonna take the body and we're gonna take the blood. And I believe that God is going to soften the hearts of many of you in this room who need that. After that, like we always do, we're gonna go back into a song of worship. But right after communion, we're gonna open this up in the front if you need to come and pray. Our prayer team is gonna be on the sides as we sing and as we worship. Maybe your step of obedience this morning is stepping out and you need to come forward or you need to pray somebody and somebody needs to agree with you in prayer for this, right? We prayed for you specifically in pre-service prayer and interceded that there's some people in the room, you've been carrying that weight and guess what? You don't have to carry it any longer. We believe the Spirit of God will set you free this morning from whatever weight of unforgiveness you've been carrying. And we're gonna do that this morning. If you would, prepare your heart to receive the body and the blood. look with me to the screens. We're going to say our table liturgy together. Let's repeat this. For the weary, the table is our rest. For the burdened, the table is God's embrace. For the sick, the table is heaven touching earth. For the doubting and confused, the table is God's mystery revealed. For the bitter and hurting, the table is God taking our pain. For the anxious and worried, the table is our immovable hope. For the divided and disconnected, the table is where we became one. For the unbeliever, the table is an invitation to take Christ. At the table, we declare, Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. I want you to look up there at the screen. It says, for the bitter and hurting, the table is God taking our pain. That God took your pain. The things that have happened to you, he took upon himself. He says, I'm gonna be the sacrifice once and for all for you so that you can walk in victory, so that you can walk in hope. As we step out in just a few moments, man, as you take the body and the blood of Jesus, would you let go of whatever has happened to you, whatever things that you're holding? On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, said, this is my body broken for you. I will be ripped apart so that you can be restored and be made whole. And then Jesus took the cup of suffering, the cup of his blood, which he shed on the cross for you and I, that one day when we stand before the creator of the universe, he won't see our sin, amen? He will see the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice and atonement for us. In just a minute, we who are in Christ are gonna step out and take the body and the blood. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I invite you to take today to take Jesus as Lord and Savior, that you can take him. He loves you. He's been pursuing you your entire life, and you can fall in the arms of your Savior who loves you. I invite our prayer and communion team to come. Prepare the elements. If you would, pray with me one more time. Father, we thank you for the Spirit of God at work in each of us. 
I thank you that the Spirit of God is actively involved to lead us closer to your heart, to lead us into freedom. And God, as we take the body, the blood of Jesus this morning, we receive the sacrifice and the forgiveness of sins. We receive what you've done, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. And we choose to leave our bitterness and unforgiveness at the foot of the cross. We choose to leave the things that we've experienced to walk in freedom. God, we release the debts that are owed to us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. As you're ready, you can step out of your section to the right, come forward, and receive communion.